Uh, my name is Soren Gordhammer, and I'm here with Chris Saka. And uh, the title of our talk is The Yoga of Twitter. So we'll be both excited to actually see uh, what kind of content comes from that, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. And um, it's a little bit of my background. I'm, I write a book called Wisdom 2.0. I also organize a conference every year called Wisdom 2.0, which brings together the tech crowd from Twitter and Google and Facebook along with wisdom crowd, meditation teachers, um, Zen Roshis. So Chris last time was on a, a panel with a, a Zen nun, which was pretty interesting. And so every year we gather and what we do is we look at, as our culture is growing technologically, how do we really infuse that with consciousness? And that we use these technologies for the advancement of consciousness rather than just to kind of keep us distracted and busy. So that happens every year and I organize that and bring that together and um, explore in all different domains. What does it mean to live not just constantly connected in our life, but consciously connected? And that can these technologies be a force for consciousness? Chris, do you want to introduce us? Uh, I'm, so I'm Chris Saka. Um, I think first and foremost for this room, I live in Truckee, actually. So it's really <laughs> welcome. Thanks to have you all here. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I used to work at Google uh, pre-Gopi. I'm not even sure if we overlapped much. Um, my main role up here is to be the before picture in contrast to his after. So if my phone isn't turned off, I lead a very <laughs> balanced life. Um, and, uh, but I, I, my relationship to Twitter specifically is I was the first investor. I still work as an advisor to the company once a week. Um, I do that from up here. And it's kind of fun because I was just considering that I both met you through Twitter mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, Walter who runs Tahoe Yoga, the local, ta the local yoga place here in Truckee, um, I was riding my bike across country last fall and Walter was sending me these shout outs and then uh, ultimately gave me a free yoga class to like unwind all the <laughs> shit I'd done in my body after uh, 35 days on my bike. So um, so anyway, it's kind of it's kind of cool to be here. The first time we had this talk, it was just as enlightening to me because um, I, I was really intimidated. I had this mm -hmm. Zen monk sitting mm -hmm. on my right, Joan Halifax is mm -hmm. that her name? And uh, I'm sure a lot of you know her, et cetera. And I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to get wrapped on the knuckles or what for <laughs> Twitter. And suddenly she's like, without Twitter, my life would be impoverished. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I'm going to shut up and let you talk. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. So yeah. anyway, cool. what's, what's on your mind? Cool. So I think uh, the, the, the structure is we're, gonna, we're kind of putting these two words together, kind of yoga and Twitter, and kind of seeing what comes from that. But I, first question I just kind of want to pose, and we're just going to bounce back and forth. We're friends, and we bounce back and forth on Twitter, so now we're bouncing back and forth live. Um, the first question I want to um, kind of pose is that a lot of people look at these new devices, it's Facebook and Twitter, and it seems like from the spiritual perspective, it seems pretty goddamn meaningless, right? Like, who cares what you had for breakfast? Who cares what you're eating for lunch? You don't care what I have for breakfast? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> And it doesn't really look like a lot of people look at it and just go, that's kind of like lame. Aren't there some like more important things we can be doing with our life? Like, like there's children who are suffering, there's, um, there's um, people in need, and like we're kind of on this line sharing about our life. So like from, from sometimes like the people in the spiritual communities, they look at that and kind of just go, that's kind of lame. Yeah. And how would you respond? Mr. Yeah. Well, first of all, I wish I had like a an inside yoga joke to drop, like Gopi did, where I could be like, oh, he's calling like Shiva. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone here is laughing. I'm like, uh, right on. I was kind of looking at the model of his phone. Um, but uh, No, I, I think if we listen to everyone's phone calls going on in this country right now, 93% of them would be total and utter wastes of time, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, dude, can you play? Right. Or like, oh, I was so wasted last night. <laughs> and, and yet... Among those would be these jewels of interpersonal connections. It would be people reconnecting. It would be people talking at long distance. It would be people pouring their hearts out, breaking up, getting back together. It would be, it would be all these nuggets of, of insight, of true human connection. And I think Twitter is the same way. And I think one of the beauties of Twitter was in the beginning, we didn't tell anyone how to use it. And so it was hard to use because we mm -hmm. didn't tell you how to use it, right? Um, there used to be the service called Dodgeball that Google bought, made by the same guys who now made Foursquare. And Dodgeball worked like Twitter. It was text-based, and it had a very specific syntax. So it would tell you, here's where you enter your name. Here's where you tell people the specific location you're at. Here's where you can put in you know, five words of, of message. And so it was neat because its purpose was to help you find your friends at which bar they were hanging out in. But it was so constrained that it turned out people didn't use it very much because it didn't allow that flexibility for all these other uses. So on Twitter, we very intentionally left it wide open for users to figure out how they wanted to use it for themselves. And in the beginning, that's daunting, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 
Um, you know, you look at you look at schools that don't have okay schools where there's like sororities and fraternities. People join them and then they spend their whole time trying to like distinguish themselves from the stereotype right. of their sorority or fraternity, right? right? right. Like oh, I'm not like the regular tridelts, <laughs> right. but but in schools without Greek systems, like everyone ends up tending towards the same flannel shirt wearing, white baseball cap wearing, mm -hmm. kind of you know Tuesday to Thursday out at the bar kind of guy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. I think the same thing happened in the beginning of Twitter. Like people were like, I don't know what else to say other mm -hmm. than what I'm actually you know the soy latte I'm drinking mm -hmm. right now. And then I think people started to realize, like, this is a channel for actual personal expression. This is a channel mm -hmm. for, for sharing things that are meaningful, that are slightly vulnerable, mm -hmm. that, are imp that, that do have impact. This is a way for me to promote the causes that matter to me. Um, mm -hmm. This is a way for me to share news, like actual mm -hmm. event-driven news. Mm -hmm. This is a way for me to do business and find people. Like, I probably wouldn't have made it to Tahoe Yoga unless Walter had reached out to me. And he mm -hmm. reached out to me not as a brand, but as an individual reaching out to another individual. I mean, we met because you were reacting to some of the things I said and we started a discussion that ended up meeting in person. And so I feel like there are incredible nuggets of, of meaning within there. Um, quotes, just, just, just high impact statements, links to really cool stuff mm -hmm. that kind of blows my mind. And it's in there, but you have to kind of sort through yeah. the wheat. And yeah. to do that, you kind of have to be selfish about who you follow. Like, mm -hmm. I don't politely follow anyone. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it can be, it can be a little, <laughs> you know, Politically improper. We should say how many people you, you have. I follow six hundred people. And how many people follow I think, you? I think of them probably four, three hundred fifty or four hundred people actively tweet. Okay. I have one point three million followers. Okay. So much so less. It's a little bit of imbalance, yeah. right? It's a little bit asymmetric. But I think because I'm choosy about who I follow, I get a much higher quality stream, mm -hmm. and it has those those really rich nuggets in there. Mm -hmm. And so, what would it look like in the world? Because I know that Twitter's Twitter's vision, the number one core value, guiding vision, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if this came from Ev or who it came from, but is to be a force for good in the world. Yeah. So how do you take that and convince all these millions of users to actually make it a force for good with, at the same time, not dictating how they should use it? Yeah. Well, it's funny because be a force for good came as like the Play contra of Google. positive of Google's don't be evil, right? right. And it, it's often misquoted. but. Um, but yeah, we decided like we needed to be an affirmative force for good, which right. by the way, I think Google absolutely is. But um, like our 15th hire was a corporate social responsibility person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been kind of nuts actually. In fact, as the investor, it used to drive me a little crazy. I'm like, dude, we got stuff to build. Like, <laughs> and we're, <laughs> we're too busy to help people. Uh -huh. um, but, but I think what we found is that um, leading by example rather than nudging people mm -hmm. and pushing them actually mm -hmm. has worked for us. Mm -hmm. So we found that um, that humans really care. And when you make it easy for them per to participate in a cause mm -hmm. or to advance that cause, you'll find things go viral really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I work a lot with a group called Charity Water, where we bring um, clean water to the billion people on the planet who don't have access to it. It's like a staggering number, right? Charity Water derives almost all of its giving from the internet, and specifically from Twitter. Mm -hmm. They have really understood how to make that a personal daily engagement. Mm -hmm. So instead of just coming to you in the holiday season and being like, please give us part of your Christmas giving or something, mm -hmm. every single day they put up a picture, their picture of the day. It's from a water site somewhere, and uh, there's 16 countries being served right now. Most of the pictures come from Haiti or Ethiopia. And um, it's always of a child smiling after receiving water. Mm -hmm. It's never the distended belly suffering photo, mm -hmm. et cetera. But what happens is you follow Charity Water and it becomes part of your every day. It's, it's mm -hmm. a deep personal connection to this, mm -hmm. to this association. And, and what we found is people love that. They, they mm -hmm. want that in their lives. And, they, mm -hmm. and, and those organizations that create that quality content that kind of really does speak to your heart, like mm -hmm. get massive followings and then mm -hmm. can move those people to be engaged. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I work a lot with the Livestrong Foundation mm -hmm. um, and you know, Fighting Cancer, inspired by Lance Armstrong. And, and, um, if you cruise around Twitter, you'll see these little yellow Livestrong bracelets on people's pictures on mm -hmm. Twitter, right? I think there's four million of those out there now, wow. and um, and it you know it was a way to kind of like bring that offline movement back right. to online. And you'll see like, you know, Lance had some pretty crappy days in the tour this year as well as last mm -hmm. year, and um, I sent out a note actually last year. I was headed over the tour to see Lance, and I sent it out a note and said, if you have a Livestrong story, I sent this in Twitter. Um, Send it to me, email me at this address, and I'll print it out and I'll take it to Lance. So we got so many stories back, I couldn't actually print them out. It was too physically, like, I would have had to bring extra luggage. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was such, there was such engagement and such response from this community. It was pretty wild, wow. actually. Wow. Yeah. 
And it was just, I mean, we had a Live Strong board meeting, and the chairman of the board there, uh, sorry, the vice chairman of the board said, he doesn't know of anything that's been more impactful for Live Strong um, than Twitter, with the exception of the bracelets. Like, mm -hmm. it's just pretty, it's pretty amazing. That, so that direct and daily interaction right. is nice. So how do you, like, I used this quote from Thich Nhat Hanh earlier, right? He says, the greatest gift you can give someone is their attention. And so when I tweet, I'm Wait, you say? the greatest gift, the guy just gave me his uh, <laughs> When um, Sorry, I had to. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, go ahead. I'll just take a breath for a moment. <laughs> um, the, the greatest gift. Is, and um, so, so for example, when I tweet, I'm, I'm saying this is worthy of someone's attention, right? I'm saying, like, I'm going to put this out, and this is worthy for you to spend, like, even if it's three seconds, like, taking the time to read that. So how do you determine as a, as a user what is actually worthwhile to act, to take someone away from their family or whatever else they're yeah. doing and saying this is this is worthy of attention? Yeah. Well, that's what's cool. There's a real time feedback loop. Um, if I so it was funny. I was I was I was writing down notes to your slides actually, and uh, <laughs> one of them was um, friend yourself, right? And so mm -hmm. that's actually not a big problem on Twitter because most people there are just it's it's you know self grandiosity and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but Today I retweeted, meaning I took somebody else's tweet and sent it out again, this tweet from Kanye West. He's one of our newest high-profile Twitterers, and he is absolutely over-the-top ridiculous. And today he tweeted, I love me. And that was the exception. <laughs> right? I am like, <clears throat> that is the quintessential example of just a ridiculous uh -huh. over-the-top. Like, that uh -huh. sums him up in, you know, in, in one <laughs> sentence. Right? So I retweet it, and... Some of my followers didn't get, like, I was retweeting it out of sheer irony. I right, was retweeting right, it out of, right. like, come on, right? right like, right. And, um, and, and so I got these angry messages back, like, dude, if you're going to be retweeting Connie, I'm going to have to unfollow <laughs> you. And so I had to, like, take time to explain to people, no, 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 I was just busting right, chops. Right. Like, but there is this feedback loop. Okay. And I, when, I, when I write a tweet, I pause and think about it, and I sometimes show it to my girlfriend, Crystal, and I kind of mm -hmm. think, like, well... You know, because all right. So back when we ran meetings at Google and stuff like that, um, there used to be this tool where you count up how many people were in the meeting and you think of the how what they cost, like their actual hourly wage, mm -hmm. right? And you'd put it up on this screen behind you, and it started this ticker that was like the dollars <laughs> ticking off. Uh -huh. So as the meeting's going on, you're like, "This is a twenty-seven thousand dollar meeting." <laughs> like, and what you start to realize, you're like, when I, I give you know I give speeches and I'm like. I better provide. If we got fifty people in the room and it's an hour talk, I better provide. 50 people hours worth of value, mm -hmm. or I mm -hmm. should shut up, and mm -hmm. everyone should go back to what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? And so on Twitter, if I've got 1.3 million followers, mm -hmm. and I'm sending something out, I better not be stealing their time. Right. You know, every now and then right. you read a tweet, and you're like, dude, I want my seven seconds yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and now I want the five <laughs> seconds back I was using to complain about the seven <laughs> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, but you just, you, you, you think, like, okay, how am I going to add value? And I, I, it was funny, I lost a friendship uh, two years ago, I think, when... Somebody asked me to promote their movie, and um, I don't have any problem promoting the things I love and the things I really. Um, but uh, this movie was particularly crappy. Like mm -hmm. I could just tell. Like mm -hmm. I watched the movie, I'm like, this is horrible, dude. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, 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 you have such a big audience. It's not tracking right. well. We need. And so I was like, no, I, my audience will immediately tell that this yeah. is inauthentic. Yeah. They will yeah. immediately know that I'm not being sincere, yeah. and I will lose that trust. Right? right? It's the same trust that Google could make a gajillion dollars. That's an exact number if they advertise <laughs> on the front page of Google, right? But they have said, we have this trusting yeah. relationship with you where we want to maintain this oasis on the internet where yeah. you can breathe and do your searching <laughs> and not worry about that assaulting you. And so I know if I compromise that, I'm screwed, yeah. right? Yeah. You can't get to that many followers being insincere. Yeah. So I have to really worry about that every time. Nice. And it, are these 140 characters or less providing value? Right, right. Or fewer? Anyway, go 140 ahead. 140 characters, <laughs> that's good. Like for me, my experience on Twitter is it's it's not quite I wouldn't call it a dating service. <laughs> but like I get to know I get to know you. Dude, if you keep saying that, I'm not gonna get, be allowed to use it anymore. Crystal's but gonna like, be like, come on, what? Look, so I'm like with, with Chris, I'm like, is he like someone I wanna meet with, right? And I realize you watch their tweets for like a week, you really get it like it's really hard to hide and be and, and be full of shit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean eventually it start your personality starts to show itself. So you can kind of read someone's tweets for actually like maybe a week, I don't know, a couple weeks, and you really get a sense of like what drives this person, who is this person, and like does it make sense to engage? And I feel like that's why it has to be honest and it has to be authentic, because otherwise people are going to eventually see you and there's a transparency that happens. Like some of his funniest tweets, or like some of the tweets that you had are the, funny, the, the funniest, 
actually got me to feel like, wow, I trust this guy, right? And then the, <laughs> for the most part, and then the relationship, yeah. and then the relationship can build. Yeah. And I think there's this transparency that's now happening that somehow Twitter is allowing where rather than just showing our good side or a positive side, we actually show more of a vulnerable side. It, it's a really good point. You can't really fake it. Like um, For a while, maybe, but not very long. We have one of these friends who's one of these like charlatan yogis who like they kind of lord it over you that they do a lot of yoga and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and then they're assholes in real life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, don't, they don't take it off the mat into the world. They kind of leave it all on the mat and then roll it up tightly and put it in the trunk. Um, and, and if you look at this guy's tweets, it's immediately apparent to you. Like, the kinds of things he's complaining about, the kind of concerns, like, the, you know, his fancy four-by-four four kind of shit. It's just like he's the most materialistic, self-centered, like, just critical person you've right. ever met. Right. And yet, on his resume, I'm sure... He's a, you know, I'm sure he could lead a class right now. Right. But um, so you can't really fake it. And it's mm -hmm. funny. It's actually made it a lot easier to hire people because mm -hmm. you get a sense. I mean, I can't imagine hiring somebody who didn't have a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. and, I'm not, and, and not even from a professional sense, you just get a sense of who they are, what yeah. matters to them, what they're paying attention to, what they read, who else right. they interact with. Right. Um, and you get a real sense. Now, what's funny about Twitter, though, is that so, so Facebook is symmetrical, meaning like if you friend somebody, they, you know, they have to friend you back, right? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of see their updates whether or not you want to see them and stuff. And it's, it's weird because our relationships in real life aren't always in balance like mm -hmm. that, right? I mean, our best ones are, but we have all these relationships mm -hmm. around the periphery where um, they don't always work yeah. like that. And, and so I have this thing where I follow these 600 people who mm -hmm. mean something to me or inspire me. or m Many of them I haven't met. Some of them mm -hmm. I have. Um, and then I have these 1.3 million people who follow me. And what's funny is... So I tweet like five to six times a day, right? And I'm kind of vulnerable in those tweets sometimes. Like I admit mm -hmm. when I'm getting my ass kicked. And, mm -hmm. and I admit um, when I'm fired up and things are going really well. And I tell random jokes and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, so I have a lot of Twitters mm -hmm. who don't know me and they don't necessarily know that I'm sarcastic a lot. Mm -hmm. So a year ago I tweeted, um, it'll be really sad when the oldest woman in the world dies and then we don't have one anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so most of my followers are like, ah... And then I started getting this group of a couple hundred people who were like, no, you idiot. Then the next <laughs> oldest woman is the oldest. And I'm like, I can't leave this alone. I got to go. And I'm like, oh, yeah, really good point. But then after that next oldest woman dies, then we're all done, right? <laughs> and, and you find, like, those people still haven't somehow picked up on who I am. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. And, yeah, I think my response to that was, oh, maybe you're right. But I think we can all agree it'll be sad when the tallest woman in the world dies. Right? <laughs> but... But on the other hand, I've got these people who get this sense that they really know me. Yeah. So, so I, in my work, I work with a lot of celebrities, right? Mm -hmm. And when you meet celebrities, there's still this, like, there's this wall. Yeah. Like, you know they're famous. You're a little intimidated. You get the sweaty palms. Yeah. Can I get a picture? Yeah. You know? So, um, obviously, I'm not a celebrity. And obviously, there's nothing intimidating about me. And yet, these people who hear from me five or six times a day... Their, they their brain convinces their body that they know me. Mm -hmm. And so they come up to me, and they get really close, <laughs> and they're like, hey, bro, how was dinner last night? And you're like, and, and it tricks my brain and my body into thinking we know each other. <laughs> like, we're bros, and it's kind of like, ah, uh, holy shit, I'm like, wait, so do we know him? And, and uh, it's, it's strange. Like, when I was riding my bike cross country, like, I had people, I had, like, non-groupy women show up at my hotel room door and just be like, hey, what's going on? And you're like, knowing wait, you. wait, they wait, you how know. did you, how, what are you doing yeah. here? It was like freaking me out. Like yeah. I, and like, it just felt really normal to them because we were really tight, you know, like right. somehow because they, I'm a part of their day every day. Yeah. Right. And so it's this strange, like it, it's both daunting and, 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 and inspiring the, the yeah. level of connection that can be possible here. Yeah. How, how I kind of see it is like now, essentially we have our own broadcasting network. Before, we, we brought, the broadcasting networks were owned by the big companies, CBS, NBC, right? In order to get anything in the world's attention, we had to get access to get it in the New York Times, CBS. And now, we have our own broadcasting network. And you have a million followers. Other people have 200 followers, 100 followers. But that Whatever broadcast you do, please don't say I'm like the Fox News or something no, like no, that. No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> what was that tweet you did about the Fox News? It was so great. Oh, uh, I said it at your conference, actually. Yeah. That um, well, Biz Stone, oh, one of the co-founders of Twitter, says that um, that how does he put it? Sense of humor. It, it, no, it, well, we hire for sense of humor, right? So, which is weird. Like, how do you hire for sense of humor? We're not the only company. Zappos hires right. for sense of humor and stuff like that. But oh, I know what he says. He says the reason we hire for sense of humor is because humor is a delivery vehicle for the truth. Mm -hmm. 
and then I added at your conference, and that's why Fox News will never have a Daily Show, right? <laughs> so the Daily Show, like John Stewart, yeah, right? And yeah. so, um, but but it's true. It's like it's it's funny. Like we find what makes us laugh is shit that's actually true, and then the people who can say that, who can speak right. that, tend to be humbler. They tend to be self-deprecating. Right. They tend to have taken inventory of themselves mm-hmm. in the situation. They tend to suck it up and just kind of mm-hmm. enroll with it, right? Mm-hmm. And those are the mm-hmm. people that you find you work with really well, right? Mm-hmm. You want to hang out with it. You want on your team. Right. So that's why we hire for that. Cool. But, cool. but yeah, for your broadcast comment, though. Um, like, like the Iran situation, yeah. where all of a sudden people are broadcasting stuff that otherwise they'd have to go through all the channels within a large media company. Yeah, but I, I guess I have... Well, one, one hesitation I have about calling it broadcast is that it's so interactive, though, mm-hmm. and that you've ne- you know, you never really have the chance to talk back to the television, you know, unless you're like voting on American Idol or something mm-hmm. like that, and it costs ninety five cents, I think. Um, but but when you're when you're on Twitter, it really is a conversation, and mm-hmm. and if you reply to a fancy person, a brand, uh, whatever, they write back, you know, mm-hmm. um, at some scale, and so it's alive in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also, it's kind of funny, by the way, one aspect we haven't talked about at all is Twitter's the fourth largest search company in the world right now. And so Twitter does 600 million searches a day. Uh, that and was more than Google was doing. Com. Yeah, that was more than Google was doing when I got there. No, they're through search.twitter.com. Um, 75% of Twitter's traffic comes from applications right. that have been built by people who never worked at Twitter and who have no, nothing to do with Twitter and who don't have business deals with Twitter. So there's this open ecosystem where Twitter just says, go build anything you want and point it at our system and mm-hmm. you can have the data. And then um, Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo all use Twitter search to mm-hmm. augment their search. So Google's amazing, but Out they don't cost. have the stuff that just happened. Uh-huh. And they don't have stuff from you know, 179 million individual publishers who are using you know, Twitter. And so they roll that stuff up in to complete their searches. So, but it's funny, like everyone here watches stuff on YouTube like, you know, one in 50 of us upload something to YouTube, right? And so everyone here who's on Twitter feels a need to produce content, too. And it's a funny little mm-hmm. aspect mm-hmm. of that of that platform. Like, you know, like everyone here reads blogs, not everyone here blogs, mm-hmm. right? And yet on Twitter, everyone feels a need to be yeah. a publisher, too. And I think what we're going to see is an evolution of that to be a search platform where the content producers aren't the broadcast <sighs> media. They're not the, the landed aristocracy mm-hmm. of, of press. I mean, think about it. You've got, like, stone tablets... To like calf skin and stuff like that. To you know, maybe there were like a hundred guys working on scrolls and stuff. To Gutenberg and the printing press, and then you kind of go down, and each time it expands, right? And so you get to like newspapers and magazines, and there are like maybe a few thousand people worldwide who are able to get their their voice out there. And then blogs break it wide open, and yet you still need an expensive laptop and an expensive internet connection, and kind of to understand technology, right? And you be able to like start Windows. Um, and so you come one level down, and now Anyone with a phone who is capable of doing SMS is a publisher mm-hmm. to the rest of the mm-hmm. world, right? On a platform that's not just available at Twitter, but syndicated to all of these other sites around the mm-hmm. world. It's picked up by these news channels, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Everybody in this room is a publisher now mm-hmm. for free. Like, that's fascinating, right? Mm-hmm. So now, we, you know, we tend to think about it as, um, as an amplifier of some of the smallest signals in the world. Like, some of the smallest voices that are writing what would otherwise be the least heard messages in the world. And yet, if they resonate, and that's something we, by the way, measure. We have a resonance algorithm. Like, we look for things that resonate. If they resonate, they will be seen and heard and experienced by tens of millions of people. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. pretty wild, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's like the veins are open, the veins of communication are open. So we're going to open it up. Have you seen any um, uses of Twitter that that struck you as innovative or sort of therapeutic, if anyone's doing anything actually um, where the after Twitter and was sort of sharing yoga other than advertising. Yeah, I mean, so Crystal, raise your hand really quick. Yeah, Crystal is probably the person to talk to because she has like a whole list of yoga people that she follows and sees, but um, the Daily Love, I, like, so... They're here, I think, that, right? Right? right on. Yeah, so there's this account called The Daily Love that every day is just putting like inspiring, moving messages out there, retweeting people and, and links that are pretty moving and stuff. Um, there's a thing called Tiny Buddha. Oh, yeah, Lori. Like, she, yeah, she I don't know conference. these people, but they're awesome. Um, she condenses Buddha to 140 characters at a time. Mm-hmm. Pretty awesome. One um, a day. Yeah. yeah. You think about the one-minute meditation. She's like a, I, I measure it in 140 characters. Um, yeah, she has a huge following, and she just one little wisdom piece a day. Yeah, and so I think that's really neat. I think there's a community around that kind of stuff. And then 
on a commercial basis, like studios reaching out and stuff like that. I mean, like Walter reached out to me because he saw I was busting my ass and my back hurt and like I could probably use to be put on the rack and stretched out. And so it was cool. It was value added, right? You see spammy stuff and that's no good. But when it's like that interpersonal communication, when it's of value, like I, I work with this little company called uh, Expensify that helps people fix their, um, their expense reports. Like it makes it easier to submit your corporate expense reports, which is a sucky process, right? And so what they do is they look in tweets for people complaining about being up late submitting their sucky expense reports. <laughs> and then they just send a reply and be like, hey dude, try our stuff. So, um, so I found that, you know, and I've actually found, it's kind of fun, there's like software too that's been like trying to bring presence back in. I, I have a company called Rescue Time that um, you download a little thing and, it, and it, it tracks where you spend your time online and across all your applications. And it puts this data together over a few weeks. And then you look back and you're like, oh my God, I had no idea I spent that much time on CBS Sports or whatever, right? Or like shopping or guilt group or whatever. And so what it does, is it then allows you to take that information and use it to help you build some focus into your day. And so you can kind of build like, these are my time wasting sites and I'm gonna build an alarm for myself. I'll let myself totally waste time for like a half an hour and then this alarm goes off and blocks me from using it and I get back to my job. And it's kind of fun, like people realize like, like no matter how strong you are, like check those tweets one more time. Like I wonder if anyone typed anything new. Like let me get in there, you know? And what, Your flow is totally screwed up. And one thing I would add about, so you can, you can save a search, so you can basically just find out who's talking about any particular subject. So like when I was doing the Wisdom 2.0 conference, I had a save search. Anytime someone mentioned the Wisdom 2.0 conference, so someone would mention, I'm thinking about going to this conference, but I don't really understand it. And that question in the past would be really, really hard to find. But you can search on Twitter and then reply, hey, I'm here to answer any of your questions. And you can do that with any kind of keyword with a conversation. And all of a sudden, you see all the people talking <coughs> about that. To me, that's really powerful. Yeah. By the way, I want to mention one thing about Twitter that I think it kind of plays hand in hand with what Gopi is saying. So um, you were saying, like, focus on the essential thing and do one thing at a time. And, um, and you were talking about managing your email and doing it a couple days at a time. And we have a buddy who wrote a book called The Four Hour Work Week, mm -hmm. which is funny because I've been right. in like four hour meetings with him before. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're done, right? You're going home. Um, but it's it, the principles of it were interesting. They were kind of like, you know, check your email once a week. And if it's vital, it'll make its way back to you, kind of thing. But as an analog, in parallel with what you do, I, I try and stay on offense rather than defense. And I think your inbox. Um, and this, Jason, my friend Jason mm -hmm. Schellen said this first, your inbox is a to-do list to which anyone else can attach their action item for you, right? So you wake up, you go into your inbox, and it's what everybody else wants from you. It's not your to-do list, right? So you could spend all day in your inbox just making people happy, and then you're like, wait, I didn't actually move any of my things forward. And so one of my daily exercises and part of living in Truckee rather than San Francisco is like, I can't go on random meetings for coffee for business pitches and stuff like that. If the kids want to drive three hours up to Truckee, I'll hear them out. But generally, <laughs> I get to move my to-do list forward, and I get to focus on the things I'm trying to do. And I, I tie this into Twitter because your, your email inbox is a dam, right? Like everything that flows into that thing stops at you, and it goes nowhere unless you react to it. And that's daunting, and it creates this like lingering anxiety with us. We could always be doing more of that stuff, and we could always be replying to more. And the more we reply, it like metastasizes. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, Twitter is this stream that's kind of going by. And like, if you it, you can choose the ones to reply to, you can choose the ones to watch, you can make sure you don't miss them from your essential friends. But the rest just kind of go by. And if you haven't checked in in a while, that's fine. Like, if it's a really amazing tweet, it'll make its way back to you by retweet and stuff like that. But there isn't this, like, anxiety that you're missing it. Like, it just kind of goes by. And so if you got a moment, you check in, you see these really cool interactions from friends who don't share your geographic space, and yet you feel connected to them. And yet, if you don't want to log in, you don't have to, and it just kind of goes by. And, like, that's been something that I think has been really refreshing for me as I've moved my life kind of out of my inbox to my to-do list and to Twitter is that when I'm not there, it still happens and it's fine. Like, I'm not yeah. missing it, you know? The other thing I think, just to add one thing to that, is so on Twitter, there's something called direct message. You can send someone a message, 140 characters. But in order for some, to receive a message from someone, you have to have, you have, to have decided to follow them. So you have 600 people, right? I have yeah. 100 people that I follow. So there's essentially 100 people that I said, you I give you permission to contact me. Whereas email, I have all kinds of anyone in the world, right, somehow get my email address and come through. So if I need to contact Chris, 
I send him a direct message because he knows he's already sussed me out, right? He's already been like, all right, you're in. And the communication can happen more effectively. So okay, so, oh, oh, sorry. We're, we're, oh, okay. You guys we're are going to have to catch these guys after. Right. Um, let me just say a couple, couple quick things. Um, since I didn't introduce Chris and I left it to Soren, I wanted to add this one bit, that, which is that, um, well, there are two bits. So Chris was um, named the most influential business man or business person in America by the Wall Street Journal. Um, so you got a little taste of that today. And, uh, and as he told me, he said he did it all without ever putting on a suit and dress shoes. The other thing is that um, he, he has a venture capital firm called Lowercase Capital, which um, he won't probably respond if you send him tons of stuff. <laughs> but you should check out his site because it's really beautiful. Yeah. It was designed and by Crystal, actually. His girlfriend yeah. Crystal designed it. Yeah. Um, and the last question, which these guys can ask their other questions of you, but I wanted you to talk about the decision to live in the woods and not have, is it, was it cell phone access at home? Cell phone reception? Yeah. We yeah, just, I mentioned that. Was yeah, we can just say a couple words about. Yeah. Well, so there's all these different media of communication, like ways to reach somebody, right? But a lot of them are interruptions. And, um, and, and it's funny, like, I don't talk on the phone. Um, I, I try at all costs to avoid the phone. My phone number is a scarce, scarce resource. Like, <laughs> I don't have it. Very few people have yeah. it, yeah. Um, because, um, because it interrupts. Like, it, it, you know, like when somebody rings, I, there's no sense of... So in the technology world, we use the word presence, actually. So I was one of the co-founders of Google Talk, which became Google Chat, which is like when you're on Gmail and you're chatting. Like, we built that. And it was originally intended to be a presence engine, which was a smart way to figure out how reachable you are, right? We failed at that part. Like, now it's, it's just a green circle and that kind of stuff. But, um, but part of what was inspired, where it was inspired from was... Um, at Google, we were always trying to figure out the best way to seat people in the company. Like, when are people most productive? Like, you put an individual in an office behind a door, and it turns out they spend a lot of time screwing around. Um, in fact, when do you, uh, a really quick question. When on the internet is most porn accessed? So During the, the, the traffic yeah. to the porn sites. Yeah, it peaks from noon to one, right? <laughs> Isn't that, that's heartbreaking, right? So, yeah, everyone's like, oh, eight or 11 or after the kids go to bed. No, it's noon to one. And so you put somebody in, an, in the, like a room all alone and you don't get really good interactivity and collaboration out of them. It turns out you put somebody in a room with, with a bunch of other people in cubes and it gets too loud. And so at Google, they have these fishbowl offices that have three to four people in them and they're glass walled. And so it turns out three to four people can kind of collaborate and chit-chat and then get to work and not distract each other. But it also has this sense of presence. And so that glass wall, if I walk up to it, I can kind of see whether you're interruptible or not, right? Whether, it, like, this is a good time to mm -hmm. bother you and stuff. A lot of the forms of communication that we have don't have that built in. So people can't tell mm -hmm. how interruptible mm -hmm. I am right now. And it totally messes up my flow. Because I don't know about you, but even up here, in a, in a really good day, I'm like in the zone kicking ass like an hour and a half, maybe two hours. The rest of my day is a distraction. It's eating, it's showering, it's working out, it's um, transportation to and from where we're, you know, the hike we're going to do or something like that. It's, it's all these things that are kind of like, you know, dealing with family and stuff that are kind of like taking away from that time where you're actually in the zone kicking ass, getting something done, right? And so... We try and do everything we can, and we did at Google, and we do at Twitter, and I have 39 other companies that I work with, to try and peel away some of those layers of potential distraction to optimize the likelihood that that hour and a half of, of flow becomes like two hours. If we get like two hours of flow out of our people, we win, right? And so, so moving up here allows me to optimize communications to the ones that are asynchronous. And then... What's cool about it is we get visitors who come and actually stay with us. And <laughs> like my startups will come up one at a time as a team. And we'll sit down and we'll spend like three days together, like partying in the woods and playing sports and eating. And, and it's like, it's that meaningful, synchronous, face to face, present time. And then the rest of it goes asynchronous to email. Mm -hmm. and, and I think these in between steps can be a real, a real obstacle to getting stuff done and to being like productive. And so, you know, I, I respond to about 5% of the emails I get. Like, 
if you look on the internet there i have my haters you know who think i'm an aloof ivory tower guy who doesn't respond to things but i have to be necessarily sh selfish about all those people who want a couple minutes of my time like that builds up and if i give it to them i don't have it for my relationship i don't have it for my health i don't have it for mm -hmm. the companies i do work with and stuff and so being up here allows me and us to stay on offense instead of like playing defense and reaction to everybody else thank you so cool. that is it folks thank you so much i think that thank these you. guys will be around be to around. answer some questions if you have some thank you guys i appreciate it <laughs> cool. thank you